Morning, church. Ooh, I feel like I got like the thunder of the Lord on my voice right now. This is fun. Let's keep it. Just joking. But if it helps, sure. Hey, how's it going? What are we getting into today? Psalms. So open up your books. That's right. The weird things in front of you. They, they're ancient tomes with pages and ink. Crack them open in the Bible. You're going to crack one open? No? You're just going to sit there? Oh, there she goes. All right. We got some effort. Um, we're going to Psalm 95. Uh, and this is a, a classic song on worship. And we're going to talk about worship. We're going to get into this psalm because this psalm has lots of, lots to say to us. When you are listening slash reading this psalm, I want you guys to look at uh, patterns, little phrases, little words that get repeated. Try to figure out what's going on where. Uh, you feel good? You ready to do this? Psalm 95, hear now the word of the Lord. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great king and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and the dry land, which his hands have formed. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before our Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today we would listen to his voice. Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day of Massa in the wilderness, when your ancestors tested me and put me to the proof, they had, though they had seen my work. For 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are a people whose hearts go astray and they do not regard my ways. Therefore, in my anger, I swore they shall not enter my rest. This is the word of the Lord. This is called the Venite. Everybody say Venite. Venite, it's a classic text on worship. It's, a, it's the O Come worship, because we have that um, a few times in there. And it's all about worship. This is, this is poetry at its finest. This is the language of art. This is the language of expression. This is the language of trying to illuminate that which is really difficult to illuminate. This is, this is trying to illuminate truth. This is exciting stuff. So let's get back into the text. Verse 1, what does it say? O Come. Let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. This is the language asks a few questions. This psalm says, what is worship? Number two question is, why do we worship? Number three question that we should ask ourselves is how. How can we worship better? How can we be better worshipers? So first, let's ask the question, what is worship? Worship is the act of ascribing ultimate value to something that engages your entire being, mind, will, and emotions. And all of those three uh, uh, notes or themes get hit on in this psalm. Verse 1, O come, let us sing to the Lord, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence in thanksgiving and let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Let us Leap out of our own skin. Let us make a joyful noise. Have you ever made a joyful noise? Church, are you awake? <laughs> Woo! Let us make a joyful noise. This, this, is, don't, this, this psalm is saying don't just sit in your pews and look up dead-eyed at whatever is happening in front of you. This is let us make a joyful noise to the Lord. This is let your emotions erupt within you. It is okay to be excited. It's okay to be over, overwhelmed and overflowing with joy and exuberance and excitement. Uh, uh, in my house, it's, it's rough sometimes because my wife um, is really, really good at, at music, but that also means her ears are like intense. They are lasers. They, can, they know notes. Of, uh, she can identify the notes with which you speak. Like she's weird. Um, <laughs> But that also means that I can't 
uh, like, shout with exuberance real fast. And she'll, she'll, I'll, she'll, she'll be in the house, and I'll, I'll make a loud noise, and she'll be, shh. I think she also grew up in a house where uh, that, was, that was not a thing. And it's hilarious, because I'm like, girl, when can we make noise? When? Is it okay to be loud and excited? And it's also funny, because she's a singer. She does it for a living. <laughs> what? This is a house of worship, and it should be okay to make a lot of noise. I'm happy that our, our band makes a whole bunch of noise. It's good for us. This is the language of emotion. Bump down to uh, verse 6. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. This is the language of the will. It takes something for you to bow down. It takes a certain uh, desire and will, you have to bend your will. You have to bend your pride to take a knee before someone who is greater than you. Amen? This is the language of the will. Bump down again, verse 8. Do not harden your hearts as in Meribah and Massa in the wilderness when your ancestors tested me. Now, uh, we've got a weird thing. It's called English, and it, uh, it has uh, certain colloquialisms where we talk, when we talk about the heart, we think feelings, emotions, and stuff. But it, the, the Hebrews, I think, had it right. The heart includes those things, but in, in fact, the heart is the, your seat of understanding. They would talk about your heart being the center of your being. Uh, Dallas Willard is amazing reading on this. Go, go read some Dallas Willard about the, the heart. Renovation of the heart is a really good one. But the heart is actually the mind, and the mind is actually the heart. So when people are talking about the mind, make sure you're referencing what is the mind. The mind is the seat of understanding. How I understand myself, the world, the universe, God, and everything, everyone and everything in it. The heart is the seat of understanding. Do not harden your hearts. Do not close down your hearts. We live in a culture right now that is uh, loving the aspect of closing down our hearts to one another. Amen? We can't listen to one another. We have no dialogue or conversation with one another. We're constantly fighting and in fear of one another because we've hardened our hearts to one another. Do not harden your heart to the Lord. This space, a space of worship, a space in your day-to-day -day life, Monday through Saturday, let alone Sunday, is a place for you to not harden your heart to God. Do not close yourself off to what he might have to say to you. You can also follow that up if you want to get super biblically nerdy. Uh, for each one of the outcomes, for, for verse 1, 6, and 8 here, he's talking about the different aspects of worship, bringing your whole being to worship, your mind, your your will and your heart, your emotions to, to worship, uh, follow it up. A couple verses down, you'll see four. Why? Four. So verse one, we've got a corresponding verse in verse three. Four. The Lord is great. He's a king above all kings, a king above all gods. His hands made this and that and the other thing. We've got verse six, corresponds with verse seven. Four, he is our God and the prophet. And that we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. You can correspond. These are the fun patterns with us within Psalms. If you take a beat and really get into Psalms, they have awesome structure. There's a reason why they're uh, formed into songs a lot. Praise worship, praise worship songs because, you know, music is the language of math. Worship is like a brooch or a, f a, a, a family ring, an heirloom. And you've been carrying it around your house, and you might have gotten it from a, a grandma or a great grandma or something, and, and it's got it's it's beautiful in its own way, and, and you you take it and you've just kind of had it in a cupboard or maybe had it in a drawer for years and years, and maybe maybe your your mom or your uh, uh, grandparent or something gifted it to you, and they had it in a, a, a drawer or something for years and years, and then you're like, you know, what, what's going on with this thing? I'm gonna go get it appraised, and the the. The, the monocle-clad Monopoly man looks, looks at the brooch, and he, he kind of takes a, a double take, and he, he, he gets in even closer, and he starts freaking out. He's like, oh my gosh, what is this? 
and, and he recognizes the incredible value of this brooch. This isn't just a brooch. This is a long-lost ancient heirloom of a, of a royal family long ago where the art of making such a brooch has been lost to humanity. No, this is absolutely unique. There is no other like it. And its value is beyond measure. And then that person, you get take home your brooch and you are freaking out because what you thought, what you had tossed in the back of one of your drawers, which your parent or your parent's parent maybe had tossed back in the back of an armoire or a drawer, just sitting there, you weren't living in accordance with the value that you had. And worship is reassigning that new value to something that you didn't know was priceless. Worship is an act of ascribing ultimate value to God. You want to talk about decisive validator? When forming an identity, this is, a, this is a, uh, the foundation of formation, right? How do we form a Christ-centered identity? It's understanding the value of what you have in front of you. The value of God, the value that, <laughs> of a God that actually gives you value. But that kind of leads into our second point or our second question, which is, why should we worship? And to answer that, the Bible tells us, Jesus tells us, and, and good, shoot, secular writers tell us, uh, you're worshiping anyways. Everyone worships, worships. We were designed to worship. You can't help but worship. One of the cool uh, illustrations of this is, is in Harry Potter, the first book. When he first gets to Hogwarts, He's freaking out left and right because there's magic everywhere. There's this whole hidden world that he never even knew about it. And uh, uh, one night, he's, he's going around the castle like you do as a wizard. Um, and he stumbles into this room, and, he, and he, he, he unveils this giant mirror, and it's the mirror of Erised. Uh, and, and because it's a children's book, it's not too subtle because Erised is just desire spelled backwards. And the mirror of Erised, he looks into it, and he sees himself surrounded by his family. And if you don't know anything about Harry Potter, where have you been? You're a fool. <laughs> it is, they, they are wonderful, wonderful pieces of literature. Uh, but his family has been killed. He is the only one left. He's the only Potter around. And he's surrounded by his dead family. He's surrounded by his mom and his dad, and they love him, and they're just embracing him and they are rejoicing with him because they have been reunited, and they were killed when he was a baby, and he never even knew them. And he freaks out, and he says, oh my gosh, this has got to be magic. So he goes and gets his buddy Ron, and Ron comes in, and Harry, thinking he's going to see his parents, he's going to show Ron his parents, Ron looks into Mary, and he sees himself as head boy of the school, of his class, and as a sports hero, a Quidditch hero. He sees himself clad with accolades and, and trophies and merits. He's like, oh my gosh, this mirror is great. Thanks, Harry. This is amazing. And they can't figure out what's going on. Why don't they see each other's reflections in the mirror? And then Harry Potter's uh, a mentor comes, Dumbledore, he says, this is the mirror of Erised. This mirror shows you the deepest desire of your heart. He goes on to say that people... The reason why it was in a weird, random room in the halls of this castle, covered by a sheet, is because people find themselves wasting away before this mirror. They bow down to it in worship. Why should we worship? Because we're worshiping anyways. Either way, that which is worthy, your worship is something that doesn't deserve it. What? Erase that bit. That sentence makes no sense. Uh, David Foster wrote this about worship. David Foster is an uh, 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 author, and he doesn't believe in God. So peep this, fam. If, your worship, if you worship money and things, if they are where you tap your real meaning in life, ascribe ultimate value, in other words, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure 
and you will always feel deeply ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before, you finally, before they finally plant you in the ground. On one level, we all know this stuff already. It's been codified as myths, proverbs, cliches, epigrams, and parables, the skeletons of every great story. The trick is keeping the truth up in front in daily consciousness. Worship power. You will, you will feel weak and afraid, and you will need ever more power over others to keep that fear at bay. Worship your intellect as being as smart as possible. You will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out, and so on and so on. Some people freak out when they break up, when they lose a relationship. They freak out. They don't know what to do. Some people don't. Some people have no problem with that. Some people break up, and, and it's okay, but, but they might lose a job, and they'll lose their mind. They'll freak out because their money or their security is, is in jeopardy. When normal life happens, you know, normal life, when things like loss, defeat, failure, sickness, brokenness affect your life, when they come into your life, you know, normal life, normal stuff. Pay attention to what really rattles you, what really freaks you out. And if you are constantly freaked out and suffocated by anxiety and worry, nothing less than reassigning your ultimate value to God will free you. True worship transfers the worship that we already have in our lives to God, the only being worthy of it. True worship discovers the true value of the brooch and then lives in accordance with the true value of the brooch. Why worship? Because we're already worshiping. We're already doing it. What would you see in the mirror of Erised? Only God is worthy of it, but he'll never control your, your life. This is one of those weird Christian theology things where if uh, you take, if, if you keep searching for your life, you'll lose it. But if you give your life up, you'll find it. It's Luke 17. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. If you let go of your life, you will save it. Number three, how can we worship well? And in number three, there are four different things I want to talk about. First off, if you want to worship well, if you, if, if you want to ask the question how to worship well, first off, we've got to talk about one of the themes of our whole series here, community. I would like to talk about all of them, but I just don't have time. Blame Paul. Community. You need community in order to worship. And if you want proof, look at the psalm. Look at all the plurals. Oh, come, let who sing? Us. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence. Let us make a joyful noise to the Lord. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord. Do not harden your hearts. It's all in the plural. We can definitely worship alone. And in fact, you should worship alone. You should cultivate an excellent life of prayer and an excellent life of adoration, thanksgiving, and devotion to God individually. But that is only in preparation for the good work, the corporate worship, the worship when we come together. C.S. Lewis had uh, this amazing group of friends and they would all get together and they would uh, exercise one another's creative projects together. They were called the Inklings. Everyone say Inklings. Inklings. Classic group. Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, you know, Hobbit guy. He was, uh, he was in that group. And there was, uh, within that wider group of about eight to nine, there was three of them. And it was uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, Ronald. It was C.S. Lewis, Jack. He didn't like his name. Little known uh, uh, fact about C.S. Lewis. He didn't like being called Clive. Um, so he called, so everyone called him Jack, and, uh, what, what was his name? Charles. Charles Williams, another, another famous author. The three of them were like best buds. They were, they were besties for a very, very long time. And then all of a sudden, Charles died. And, and Jack and Ronald, C.S. Lewis and, and J.R.R. Tolkien, were kind of rife. We were just like, man, 
this is terrible. What do, what do we do? And, and, and Jack, C.S. Lewis, is trying to look on the poverty. He says, he says, well, you know what? At least I'll get more Ronald. I won't have to, I won't have to share him with Charles. But as time went on, he found out, you don't. He didn't get more Ronald. Because only certain aspects of Ronald were brought out by Charles. So in fact, C.S. Lewis got less of Ronald because he didn't have Charles to illuminate that certain side of his personality. There is a lie in our culture that says if you get married or if you find some sort of significant other, that they will be your everything. That's not how we work. In fact, most of us gets brought out when we are in the company of other people. You will have very interesting, specific pieces pulled out by your significant other of your personality. But your best friend will pull out even different aspects. And your family will bring out even different aspects. And your friends will bring even different aspects. So you can see true worship is only really possible in the corporate now apply the same principle to God. If you think you can find out the whole being of who God is alone in your room as a monk, you're wrong. You need other people. We need each other because you're going to bring out a piece of God that I don't know yet. And you're going to bring out a piece of God that I don't know yet. And I'm going to bring out a piece of God that you guys don't know yet. And we're only going to illuminate his character, his will, his heart, his goodness, his beauty, his truth with each other. This party won't happen alone. We need other people in order to celebrate, in order to enter into true worship. Number two, the other thing we need to know, uh, or the other thing we we have to have in order to, to increase our worship, in order to enter into true worship, is truth. It's a good question to ask. The psalmist says, how does he know? How does he know that the Lord is great, the king above all gods? In, the hands, in his hands are the depths of the earth. He created the mountains and the seas and the land. How does he know he's, the, he's our maker? And what the psalmist is doing is he's standing on the tradition and on, on the wisdom of the prophets, of the texts that have come before him. He's trusting in truth that which has come before him, that has been tested Furthermore, uh, one of the things that you need, you need to worship, you need, you need trust in, in that which comes before you, which is basically the basis of all education, so don't, don't throw too much salt on that because you'll uh, cut, undercut anything you think you know because you got that from somebody. Um, for, and, and then secondly, you, it, it cuts you off from community. If you don't, Worship in truth, if you don't worship with other people, uh, oftentimes you'll, you'll want to create your own God. And when you create your own God, which is what we're all doing anyways, by the way, remember the mirror of error said, but if, if you create your own, like, Jesus-type God, instead of the God of the Bible, instead of the God that pushes back against you, you will, you'll have a God that doesn't push back against you. You'll have a God that doesn't challenge you. You'll have a God that doesn't piss you off. <laughs> you'll have a God that doesn't uh, grow you. You'll have a God that never disagrees with you. You'll basically have a lap dog for a God. Who wants to worship that? You gotta clean up its poop. It's weird. <laughs> Furthermore, the last thing is you 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 you've got to worship. Uh, you, you need brutal honesty for truth. You need brutal honesty in your prayer life, and you need brutal honesty in your worship life in order to get genuine, transformative worship. You need brutal honesty. You need brutal honesty in your prayers that lead you to brutal honesty in your worship. So it's, it's way easier to come to God and worship, to bow down and hit your knees before the Lord when you've uh, come, to, to come to grips with all the shame and guilt and faults and failures that you have in front of God. It's called confession. It's a, it's a beautiful virtue and art that a lot of Protestant denominations have lost. It's so much easier to hit your knees and proclaim your love for God when you've confessed that you're a self-absorbed little idiot. Amen? When you've been a royal dippy doo to your favorite person in the world. When you've 
come clean about how you cussed out that person who cut you off in traffic earlier today. Or even more closely to home, when you've cussed out maybe your coworker or your boss in your heart because they did something that maybe you didn't like and you were just on one on that day. It's pivotally important to be brutally honest. It's pivotally important to be brutally honest because oftentimes we lie to ourselves and we convince ourselves that we're, we're doing okay and we're fine when we're in desperate need of healing and reconciliation. Amen? Worshiping in truth is worshiping in honesty. Number three, third thing we need, the Spirit. Now, although the Spirit is not mentioned anywhere in this text, uh, it does continually reference to coming into the presence of the Lord. You need to be in the presence of God. Even if you're worshiping alone, individually, you're still in the presence of the Spirit, and you need the presence to access all the different aspects of your being when worshiping. Look at verse 2. Come, let us, let us come into his presence with what? Thanksgiving. Look at, look at 6. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord. Let us come into his presence, our maker. The Spirit... Worshiping with the Spirit is like being a good sailor. Sailors can't make the wind, but they can make a lot out of it when, they, when it comes. Amen? We need the Spirit. Number four, rest. Now, if you look at this psalm, it's like boom, it's got boom, it's got three different sections, and then you look at this third section, it kicks off at the end of uh, verse seven and, and kind of with verse eight. Do not harden your hearts as at, Meribah, on the day of Massa in the wilderness, when your ancestors tested me, they put me to proof, though they had seen my works. For 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are, the people, they are a people whose hearts go astray and do not regard my ways. Therefore, in my anger, I swore they shall not enter my rest. What a weird turn. Amen? Read this thing. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Woe to you. That's a weird turn. Why? Why go in this direction? And what does it end with? What's the very last word in the psalm? It's the number one thing. It's, it's one of the most pivotally important things that we need. And at the end, he says, you're not going to have mine. Or rather, your ancestors didn't. Why does it take this turn? Look at uh, the New Testament at Hebrews. And Hebrews makes a really big deal out of this specific psalm. psalm. Now God says, uh, they shall never enter my rest. This is, this is how it ends. The author of Hebrews, Hebrews asks a very poignant question. If it's true that Joshua, remember, the, the Hebrews had spent 40 years in the wilderness, and they had they'd goofed off during that time. He said, okay, the older generation isn't even going to enter my land. We're going to sit there in 40 years, and a new generation is going to come up under you, and they're going to enter the land. So Moses, who's a part of that older generation, doesn't even get to, to the promised land. The promised land, which is filled with milk and honey. The promised land, which has been promised to you by God so that you might find rest. They don't get to go. Instead, Joshua leads the remnant of the Israels, into the promised land, and they are the ones who find rest. They are the ones who enter into the land of rest. And the, uh, the passage in Hebrews here is, uh, basically asks, if Joshua leads all his people into the land of rest, why does he still make an issue of what David says later today? If you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have taken a late spoken later about it another day. There remains then, there remains then, there's something in addition to, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters rest also rests from their work, just as God did from him. So the Sabbath isn't about just not working on Sunday. There's something else going on. If rest isn't working for you, Think of the word peace. Are you at peace? Physical rest is a must, but there's, it's referencing something deeper. It's, God isn't just interested in you not working on Sunday. He wants you to actually rest. 
in your heart, in your mind. He wants you to let go. The gospel story tells us of Jesus who lived perfectly for us. Religion says if you live a good life, then you'll get the blessings of God, which is to say if you work a whole bunch, if you live a good life, if you do these things, if you jump through these hoops, if you obey these rules, then you'll find rest. The problem is, is that will never be the case, and you will work in perpetuity. You will work forever to the bone. The gospel story, religion says that. Jesus offers us a different path. He says, I've done all the work for you. You couldn't have done it anyways. I've done it for you. Now enter into my rest. And that is pivotally important for worship. But if you live with Jesus and you are freed from the low zone of labor, constant labor and pressure, from your own anxiety, from your own heart, from your own mind, whatever you freak out about, you can find genuine rest. That'll come from us reassigning that value, that ultimate value to God who offers it to you. Sunday, then, is just another piece of work. You're just praising and worshiping some morality or some sort of hoop-jumping God where you've got to jump through all these hoops. And being here is just another day of work. You're not actually resting. Whereas if you take up an identity or if you take up a loyalty or if you take up servitude to God, you'll find genuine rest, which is hilarious. Again, it's one of those weird, wonky Christian things, Christian theology things that spins your whole dynamic on the head. If you devote yourself to servitude, you will find rest. If you give up your life, you will find it. You'll find peace. You'll stop freaking out over this, that, and the other thing. You'll be able to go under the knife, and you'll be okay. Because you, he's got you. Church, you have an opportunity here in this space, in these brick walls to cultivate, to cultivate a, a space of worship. In these seats, in these pews, this space of transformation. However, it's on you and no one else to make it so. So show up on time, <laughs> because you're robbing no one but yourself. And I don't mean show up on time in order to bear witness to the announcements or an extra worship song. Show up on time, don't stand up, don't sing, sit in your pew, but show up on time in order to give yourself more time to get yourself centered, to get your heart and your mind in a place where you might be able to commune with the God who created you. So you might be able to commune and enter into worship with one another to bring out those different aspects of God's personality that you all need to enter into his presence healthily anyways. You're only robbing yourself. If your phone helps you, great. Use it. Look up your verses. Take your notes. Do what you got to do. If it doesn't help you, put it away. Turn it off. It's an hour. You'll be okay. Do what you got to do. This is your space. Transform it. Transform it into a place that you need to cultivate an, your own peace. Cultivate your own rest. Find a space where you can actually let go. You can actually breathe. You can, you can bring your consciousness, your awareness, your heart, your spirit, your mind to something that's bigger, better, and greater than you so that you might be able to shout for joy in the presence of the Lord. Kneel down before the God who loves and created and died for you. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for, uh, shoot, man, I don't know, for, for everything. Thank you for creating us to worship. Lord, forgive us for worshiping everything except you. Thank, thank you for forgiving us for being a wayward people who forget who you are who don't know your value. Lord, help us. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, senses 
to be aware of your true value. Like the monocle and the brooch, Lord, reveal to us how incredibly valuable you are. And may us then uh, respond and act accordingly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.